Y'all need to think more with your mouth closed You the resort of a man not in the household That's why you so violent and you seeking out foes Welcome to Three Count Commentaries Let us discuss Broken Skull Sessions with Ron Simmons um, this, was a, this was a fun listen um, If you listen to Ron Simmons um, I think I've done uh, his conversation with JBL and I think they also did a documentary with the, the Acolytes documentary, uh, the untold, I believe on the APA. If you watch those two things, I think you've gotten most of this. So I don't need to go item by item. So I do have those things in the, in the archives. Hopefully I, I got them in a playlist somewhere so you can easily find them. So if you're interested in his, in his life story and everything, this is, um, uh, that's what it is. But Ron Simmons was here to, you know, for obviously black history month, but he was also here to inspire. And as usual, as I talk about these different, uh, broken skull sessions, usually there's something in there that you could pull out. And I think what we did a really good job with in this episode is going full circle when it comes to Ron Simmons, how he got into the business and, you know, was mentored and, you know, ended up being the mentor himself at the end, you know, and, uh, obviously I, I, I liked it. Um, but again, if you've seen a lot of the other stuff that he's done, it's the same story. It's just a little bit more detailed, you know, for instance, they talked about his childhood a lot more here. Um, uh, he talked about his dad leaving him after his mom died and that he was living with his grandma for a while. His grandma is the one who introduced him to pro wrestling. And she died shortly thereafter. And uh, he ended up, um, had to grow up fast. Bouncing from home to home before he ended up staying with a cousin. And then it was coaches, football coaches in junior high school, who took an interest in him that kept him in Georgia when the rest of his family moved to Detroit. So he was, he fell in line when it comes to sports. He threw the discus, he shot put, he played football. And uh, he said that everything, essentially that football, everything football interested him. So he was really into the football. He played nose tackle. Um, they told the story of how he ended up going to Florida State. And this, I think, was very interesting because there's a great lesson here. They talked about red shirting. I don't know anything about sports, really, to be quite honest. Um, but apparently red shirting is where you basically are playing shadow to people who are on the team who are there already. So if you're a freshman, you may red shirt because the guy in front of you is a junior or whatever. And Ron Simmons says, like, he didn't want a red shirt. He didn't want to do that. And all of the, even though he was from Georgia and they really wanted him to play football for Georgia, be a Georgia Bulldog and everything, Bobby Bowden, the coach of Florida State University, he was the coach when I actually liked Florida State, when they were a good football team, back when Michigan used to be a good football team. Fuck them both. Um, he, he promised him an opportunity to start if he could outplay the players before him. That it was basically a meritocracy. That if you can outplay this guy, doesn't matter that he's been on this team three years already. He, he, he could be a senior. It doesn't matter. If you're a better player, you will get an opportunity to start. And so that's what he did. He went on, he went to this team just for that opportunity. So they wouldn't waste a year of his life by him, you know, sitting on the bench watching. And, you know, he became sort of a legend from that point. And of course we all know that he became this big superstar. And he said that, you know, he, this is where he also got his huge work ethic that he was sneaking into the weight room at night and he was, you know, but he was undersized. He had bad ankles and a bunch of other stuff. So that kind of ended his, uh, his football career. He ended up playing USFL football though, where he met Lex Luger. And it was Lex Luger who, uh, was trained by Hiro Matsuda. And Hiro Matsuda was the one who trained him on the suggestion of Lex Luger. And they both sort of agreed, it was Lex and Hiro Matsuda, that there weren't enough black wrestlers. So it was all about, we need to bring in new faces. You know, somebody with a new look and a new intensity. And since he knew Lex Luger, he got denied. So they talked about how brutal his training was. And actually showed some videos from CWF in 1986. This was wonderful footage. CWF, I, I want to guess, I'm not sure if this is championship wrestling from Florida or continental wrestling. 
Uh, I'm going to guess Championship Wrestling from Florida. Um, that's what I'm going to guess. Um, so they showed these guys doing neck bridges and squats. And he said they did all this stuff three months of uh, calisthenics and cardio and conditioning before they even got in the ring. And then they did a month of hitting the ropes. And, you know, says that he talked about, he said the training was so brutal that they trained them for free. <laughs> so this was great. And then they showed um, UWF footage, which was Universal Wrestling Federation. It was owned by Bill Watts. Uh, 1987. Wait a minute. 1987. Did UWF still exist? I think it did. Uh, I think it did. So um, he wrestled a guy named Samoan Coquin. Who ended up being Yokozuna. So that was fucking cool too. They showed some footage of that. And then they talked about him going to WCW. And um, he said Dusty was a big fan of athletes. Especially football players. And Dusty was a mentor of his. And Dusty was the one who was really pushing. To get away from a lot of the stereotypical WCW stuff. As he said. Stereotypical WCW stuff. And he says that. Him and Dusty created a system. Whenever. WCW kind of plateaued for him. He would go to Japan and then he would come back. And then he says one of those times he went to Japan and came back, Dusty was gone, but Bill Watts had taken over and Bill Watts came in with a head coach attitude, which basically he was barking at guys, yelling at guys, stuff like that. But he was used to it because he had been dealing with coaches his entire life. And he said, Bill Watts continued to push that Dusty began when it comes to him being world champion and continued using Dusty's approach. Um, they took a sidebar to talk about Doom, which Doom doesn't get enough credit. And sometimes I think I was just asked what one of my favorite tag teams was, and I didn't say Doom, mainly because I didn't watch a lot of WCW, but having gone back and watched them, they really got jobbed out at that Starcade. They did that uh, silly tag team thing. Was it Starcade where they did the tag team championship? Uh, tournament and it was like a round robin tournament so it was like all those guys wrestling each other it was oof it was rough but Doom was really good they was wearing masks at that time I think they were with woman um, but they were asked about who came up with the idea Ron Simmons was not sure whether it was Jim Barnett or uh, Jim Hurd and so but he said that the idea was to team up with Butch Reed Butch Reed wasn't all with the idea because um he didn't want to wear the mask for starters. And Ron Simmons was green second. So he said that part of this was him trying to get over in his big break, but also trying to warm up uh, Butch Reed into helping him out. And says eventually woman was moved out. Teddy Long moved in. And by this point, it was Teddy Long and Butch Reed kind of really mentoring him on the business. And of course, he went through some of the best matches the doom that had with the Steiners and rock and roll express and that kind of stuff. And, um, so that was fun. And so they find to get back on track. Uh, it was, he felt dusty was grooming him to be the world champion. And Lex Luger was a friend. So if you ever saw the beginning of this storyline, there is a uh, press conference where Lex Luger is the world champion and he's saying that, you know, if I need a butler or something like that, I'll call Ron Simmons. They didn't show the footage, which probably would have made a lot of sense. But it was uh, Lex Luger was, you know, cutting this promo about, you know, if I need any extra help, I'll give you a call. It was really racial. It was really racial. And the whole thing was basically Ron Simmons would flare up uh, at at uh, Lex Luger when he would say stuff like that. And this was during... When they said Dusty was grooming him and now Bill Watts has taken over and Watts knew that his days were numbered. So he was trying to get the belt on him before he got removed from his position. Uh, so obviously they showed some footage of him actually winning the world title from Vader. Uh, Ryan said he was 31 years old at the time, but what he was mostly proud of and he really pointed this out and I really hadn't thought about it this way, but he says, look at the crowd when I win. And he said it wasn't just black people cheering. And they said that's the thing that he was most proud of is that the story was built to the point where everybody was excited when he won. And he said that, you know, of course, they asked about Vader. How did Vader feel about losing the belt? And um, Ryan was he tiptoed around it before saying that Vader wasn't about it. Vader didn't really like it. 
Um, but he ended up doing a fantastic job. Um, he didn't say why Vader didn't like it though. Uh, <laughs> he said he also didn't mind Vader's stiffness because that's the way he wanted to work. So this was very interesting right here. Um, but then he says that, uh, he felt like it opened the door for a lot of other black people to come in and to, uh, feel like they could make it to the top two. So Steve Austin then asked him, why does he feel or think more black people don't get into the wrestling business? And, uh, Ryan Simmons really just says that, uh, when you, during a certain time, whenever you saw black people, they were in subservient positions or they was always getting beat. And, you know, it was very difficult for black people to get into only seeing white guys. And this would, to me, was kind of the part where I was kind of like, hmm, not entirely sure about this. Considering if you were in a certain territory, you would always see black guys. And see, Ron was technically the first major world champion. You know, Bearcat Wright won the world, a world title before that, the WWA belt. But I don't know if that was considered a major promotion or anything like I don't think so, right? But even before that, we've done on this channel plenty of talks about black main event guys, especially in New Orleans, Ray Candy and uh, Butch Reed, you know, and um, Ray Candy versus Ernie Ladd, rather, being the first black main event in the Superdome. And it drew huge in New Orleans, which is a black town. Um, then you also had Ernie Ladd, who was a, a recurring black main event talent pretty much everywhere he went. He was a top opponent for Bruno in New York. So there was plenty of opportunities for black people to see black guys. They didn't, they didn't always become world champion. You had Bobo's Brazil and Detroit. You had them, um, in some other places too, especially in the South. So you had plenty of black top guys. The junkyard dog ran wild in the eighties, especially in New Orleans, which was another uh, concept from Bill Watts, who <laughs> strangely enough, everybody says is a racist. The only person to ever make a black guy, the top guy of his promotion is the guy who everyone calls a racist. Think about that. Anyway. Um, so you have this, this system. So while what, for what Ron Simmons is saying, it makes sense. In so much that it's national television, national cable, you know, with WCW, it's not entirely true because there's always been black top guys, you know, it's always been there. Maybe not tippy top guys. You know, he was the first to get to that level on a national stage, but on the local stage, there have been black guys who were top guys all the time, you know, it, it routinely occurred. And, um, it was another interesting thing because when you talk about this, for instance, they talk about ethnic baby faces. I think we've talked about this before and they treat black guys like ethnic baby faces. Now an ethnic baby face would be like a Bruno San Martino or a Pedro Morales being a guy who so represents the spirit and look and form of a certain demographic that you have to treat them almost like a, a bulletproof hero. This is how Bill Watts treated the junkyard dog. This is how Vince McMahon treated Bruno, you know, and later Pedro. And, um, you know, those kinds of guys, you know, that's what they kind of been looking for us in terms of a black dude on a national level. And to be quite honest, yeah, there is no black junkyard dog in wrestling today or anywhere. You know, most of the black guys today are a goose. And that's just being honest, you know, you occasionally you would get a Lashley or a powerhouse Hobbs or something like that. But then, you know, Lashley is probably the first one to really pop up in a long time. That's not a complete goofball, you know, for a long time. It was basically new day, you know, <laughs> and or Rich Swan or some shit, you know? So, um, so Lashley and, and uh, TNA and Lashley and WWE, you know, legit. You know, he's a huge mountain of muscle. You can't really turn that into much of a joke. But um, I understood why he said what he said that. I just didn't agree with it. But you can see, and I'm going to skip a lot here because he's going to talk about, you know, the Farouk look and the helmet and everything. And talk about the Nation of Domination. He talked about 
the nation of domination was he felt like the the failure of the gladiator gimmick and being a black man in the wrestling business it helped him it's, it was the springboard for the Farouk of the nation of domination because he could actually go out there and be himself a lot more than the previous incarnation of the character but he said he felt like the passion was there and the promos were there and everything started to, to, to really kind of bubble up. And from that point, he wasn't really a main event guy, even though I think that Farouk as a member of the nation could have been a main event guy if they'd actually put some effort into it. Um, but by this point, I think he was a little bit older. I think he was like maybe in his late thirties at this point. Um, but he talked about, Yes, you know, D'Lo, Mark Henry, the the good father, the godfather, rather, the rock. And those guys started to come to him and he was now the mentor. And he was, you know, in a position where he didn't want to do this either. Like he didn't really want to do the gladiator gimmick, but he sucked it up and did it. You know, kind of like Butch Reed didn't want to do the mask thing, didn't want to do Doom, but he sucked it up and get in and, and, and dealt with it. And ultimately ended up, you know, helping him along. And then this was very interesting to me. And apparently Ron Simmons didn't know this either. But D'Lo was actually present when Ron Simmons won the world title. D'Lo was actually there, apparently. Steve Austin said he heard this from D'Lo Brown, that he was actually there when, when uh, Ron Simmons won the world title. And he says, I've known that guy all these years. He never told me that. He never once said anything about it. You know, and apparently they talk all the time and D'Lo never told him at all that he was there. So that was a special, special thing. And of course, he they, they couldn't leave without talking about how Farouk started to know your role thing. And The Rock took it and ran with it, just like, you know, The Rock took Jabroni from the Iron Sheik and ran with it. Um, he's always talked about he's like, man, I have no jealous bones in my body. I am so thankful and glad. And he says what he was more proud of is that those dudes had more success after they left. You know, he was exceedingly proud of what he was able to do in mentoring these guys and to see them go forward and be able to take what he taught them to the next level. And yes, they did. They talked about the acolytes and all that kind of stuff. But to me, this is where I felt like the, the, the conversation peaked because he start when he started talking about Bradshaw, it's it's different. You know, he's talking about, you know, the whole thing with Bradshaw, he's talking about, you know, hey, it filled a void. Like what would what would it be like to ride on the road with my brother and everything, you know? So, because he had been separated from his family, so that was a personal thing for him. But in terms of mentorship and inspiration, the nation of domination is where he he kind of peaked. Because when you think about it, you know, sure, The Rock went on to become The Rock, but a lot of those guys did have a lot more success after that troop. I think every member of that group, except him, became Intercontinental Champion. They all won titles. You know, Farouk went his entire WWE career until, I think, the, uh, the APA, having never won anything. Again, he debuted in, I think, 1996. He didn't win a tag team title until he won it with Bradshaw. He didn't win any singles championships whatsoever in the WWF. But he inspired all of these other guys who went on to do great things. And The Rock became world champion. And Mark Henry later, much, 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 much later, became world champion. D'Lo Brown became sort of a, a mid-card icon. And then The Godfather did too. And if you want to count the Hall of Fame rings... You know, The Rock got one coming. The Godfather got one. Maybe D-Lo can get one too. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if D-Lo is really worth one. Mark Henry, you know, he's got one. So, these guys, you know, he sees them at, you know, he's he didn't say this, but they're basically his sons. You know, they're his wrestling sons. He spent a year or two with these guys. And he says, like, you know, hey, we didn't always ride together. But the best thing about it is we got along, you know, they listened to me. They, they 
They implemented the things that I was teaching them, you know, the work ethic, the, you know, never, you know, sitting back, waiting, just going out there, attacking every moment. It was fantastic stuff. And so while it was wrapped in language that I don't necessarily care for, like diversity and inclusion and all that kind of stuff. I think that Farouk's or Ron Simmons story is fantastic. You know, it is a story of a guy who got where he is due to his work ethic, you know, and he had all the excuses in the world, didn't have a solid family structure, didn't grow up rich. He got everything straight off the straight out of the mud, you know, and he was able to put himself in positions and deal with, you know, bullshit that he probably that other people would crack under today. I mean, look at how many people nowadays, you know, they uh, little something little people complained. Oh, Tony Strong got hit in the face with a pie. Oh, Karrion Cross had to wear a helmet. Oh, this, uh, this thing happened. You know, that thing happened. Every little thing is a reason to quit and a reason to give up. He had to push through all of that shit. In addition to not saying, saying it, but not saying it, that WCW didn't really want to push him and didn't really want to make him a star because he was black. And there's a lot of history of that WCW stuff being out there because it was a Southern wrestling promotion. But at the same time, most black people in the United States are situated in the South. And a lot of people don't know that, which is why every time you have a black superstar, it's probably best to push them in the South. Cause that's where all the Negroes are. Anyway, I loved, I like this. I like listening to the Ron Simmons, uh, talk. Unfortunately, a lot of it is some of the same stuff we've heard before, but at the same time, the footage, of CWF, his workouts and stuff like that. The footage of him wrestling Yokozuna, a young Yokozuna in the 80s. Really fun stuff. Um, getting some of the details of, uh, you know, the the Gladiator was really fun. So, I liked it. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Like, share, and subscribe. And I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace.